So in this paper, I begin to outline a specifically post-humanist and feminist approach to power. This work arises from my long-term dissatisfaction with how power and gender are presented in the European Bronze Age. The dominant narrative of the European Bronze Age suggests that the arrival of bronze led to the development of inequality and new power structures. Bronze is often effectively interpreted as a form of early capital, and what followed in its wake was inequality between those who had access to bronze and those who did not. Those who had access became leaders, those who did not became followers, and eventually the subjugated. Following the development of swords and the power of, the power of those already, work, already well networked into trade routes is suggested to have increased. They now had weapons with which they could defend their capital. Those, were, those with metal were those with power and they're always portrayed as men. In continental Europe, Christian Christiansen argues that sons who did not inherit their family farms separated from their families to become roaming bands of young warriors. These young warriors were essentially swords for hire, so the highest bidders used to defend trade routes and capital throughout Europe. Thus, a class system was born. At the top, the warrior chief, below him, the warriors, below them, everybody else. This narrative is deeply androcentric, it's masculinist, it's modernist, it's capitalist, and it is hugely problematic. <laughs> for a long time, I've struggled with how you replace this narrative. We do see the emergence of swords and a transformation in attitudes to gender in this period. We have evidence of one large-scale battlefield from the Tillens Valley in Germany. And those who argue and press against this chiefly warrior model are usually described as romantics who want to pacify the past and are often told that they're denying the archaeological evidence. The dominant narrative of this period suggests that males emerged as warriors and leaders to stand above the rest of society. They possess power. They first dominate animals through hunting and then other humans in combat. Women are excluded from the civilized world of heroic battle. Discussed often as foreign wives traded between chiefdoms in order to establish power relations. Women here are objects, they're inactive and they lack power. Warrior chiefs were wealthy and therefore they were powerful. Power in this model is something possessed by individuals, wielded by a subject over an object. It's what sustains and creates leaders and it shapes the political. And if you can't see the links to what we're currently living through at the minute, then Lord help you. I arrive at a conundrum. Do I want to deconstruct the warrior chief model? Yes, absolutely. Do I know what to put in its place? Still not quite. Do I want to acknowledge how women have been repressed and subjugated through history? Yes. Do I want to make the period that I study a place where I simply see a mirror of the patriarchy that I live in? Hell no. I'm writing about the past, but it's a past that exists in and has impact on the present. I don't want to write narratives where women always emerge as less than. So where do I sit theoretically, and what tools does my theory offer me for my Bronze Age problems? I describe myself as a new materialist and a post-humanist, and I came to these theories not via their feminism, but because they were relational. Though I came to realise the reason that they appealed to me was because they were feminist. Yet there's a paradox here. New materialism and post-humanism are all post-anthropocentric approaches, which in the literature have been actively critiqued because they're seen as, seen as failing to engage with social issues. Yet, these are all theories that are rooted in a feminism and written by feminists who care deeply about social justice, inequality and power. A post-anthropocentric approach argues that we should no longer place humans at the ontological apex in our analyses, but instead recognise the key roles played by non-humans. This involves a decentering of humans as the chief protagonists of history, and an active effort to elevate the role of non-human others. It's often framed around the concept of a flat ontology, which critiques the hierarchical ontology of the modern West, where humans sit above animals, plants, and things, and suggests this hierarchy should be flattened, so that all things, both human and non-human, are positioned on the same ontological plane. Non-anthropocentric approaches have understandably produced a backlash, John Barrett launched a ferocious critique where he suggests that the interest in materials and things in current theory comes at the expense of humans. Ruth Van Dyke has argued that abandoning anthropocentrism opens the door to treating people as objects. She argues that we have to retain our anthropocentrism so that we can take ethical stances, care for marginalised humans, fight for social justice, and hold people responsible for evil actions. Post-anthropocentric approaches as are seen as abandoning the human and therefore potentially not caring about social justice and inequality. 
In all of these critiques, power is a clear undercurrent. In this orientation around human care, we can begin to see the problematic nature of our definition of power. Power is seen as wedded to humans. If we're perceived as not caring about humans, we're perceived as not caring about power. Part of the problem here is that the complex and varied philosophical ground surrounding non-anthropocentrism is being treated as homogenous by those offering important critiques. The main thing I want to say here is that while some non-anthropocentric approaches do indeed abandon the human, for example, second wave symmetrical archaeology and triple O, not all do. Rejecting anthropocentrism does not mean that I don't study people. Rather, it means that I study them as one of many, always changing, embedded and relational. My post-humanist feminist theorists have my back here. It's not the case that they don't care about people and they don't discuss power. In fact, their books are riddled with this stuff. Post-humanism and post-anthropocentrism converge around their critique of human exceptionalism. Post-humanist scholars take a feminist stance that argues that not only are humans not ontologically exceptional, but that human, humanist thinking historically has been actively damaging and exclusionary. Post-humanists argue that humanism operationalizes a specific definition of the human that casts humans as the seat of agency and rationality, and this excludes some from the human category. Within humanism, a certain subset of humans have been upheld as the model of humanity and the seat of agency, namely white, Western, educated, property-owning, heterosexual, able-bodied, relatively young men. All other forms of humanity have been unfavorably compared to this idealized image of a human, and as a result, they've been othered and naturalized. That which is not man is the other and defined negatively as less than human, closer to nature. Power acts as a key access within this process of naturalizing and othering. Those that are excluded from the human category are presented as less powerful, less rational, and less active. Fungi, plants, viruses, and animals lack human rationality and agency. Therefore, humans are more powerful than them. Similarly, women, non-Euro-Americans, indigenous groups, less able-bodied, and LGBTQI plus identities are cast as less powerful and rational than the idealized man. Identities here are negatively and oppositionally formed. You can think about the points that both Penny and uh, Yvonne have made about this. The distance from the idealized man is what counts. Binaries abound as woman is defined as not man, BAME is not white, animal is not human. What results is an ontological hierarchy of identities and the exclusion of a whole subset of people from the category human. Humanism upholds inequality and distributes power asymmetrically. Post-humanist thinkers argue for the need to move beyond humanism to a more complex, historical, and changing understanding of what it means to be human. They replace humanism with a relational, embedded, and embodied position, sharing ground with those calling for non-anthropocentric approaches. Humans in this frame are seen as deeply entangled and inseparable from non-humans and from other humans. They can never be isolated and always act in confederations with others. This isn't about devaluing humans, but about ontologically elevating a diverse cast of others. Assemblage theory, drawn from the work of Deleuze and Guattari, offers a way to conceptualize this post-humanist world. Within assemblage thinking, humans are one of many, no longer ontologically elevated above non-humans. Assemblages are the ad hoc temporary gatherings of diverse matter that are always changing and always in process. Deland deposits a flat ontology in his formation of assemblage theory. But crucially, this is not a flat ontology that presumes that all components are the same. Rather, it presumes that all matter is equally capable of affect in the world, but that crucially, it also differs. Humans are clearly capable of being powerful components within assemblages. Seeing humans as deeply entwined in relations is not about removing culpability or blame from the human. It's not the case that we're not accountable for our actions. Equally though, overcoming inequality and fighting complex social justice issues always has to be done from a position that recognizes this entangling and inseparability of the assemblages that make up our world. If we want to overturn the assemblages of patriarchy, classism, or racism, simply espousing equality in spite of difference is not enough. 
to bring down the assemblage of patriarchy, for example, we have to deal with all kinds of relations. And we have to change relations between, for example, employers and employees, the status of breast milk, menstrual blood, childcare, the structure of buildings, the form of the workday, and a whole host of other relationships that don't pay any heed to our human non-human boundary. We absolutely can and should call out those who do wrong, but we also have to change whole assemblages of material, immaterial, human and non-human relations if we want to bring about real change. Post-humanism is a critical approach that has issues of equality and inequality at its heart. It's not about the abandonment of the human, but rather a radical rethink of what the human is. It recasts humans as inseparable from the rest of the world, and it takes those excluded from the humanist definition of human and places them at the center of what it does. As such, it is deeply concerned with issues of inequality and social justice. And from my perspective, it cannot therefore be subject to the critiques of Hodder and Van Dyck that I discussed earlier. The post-humanist stance is also anti-binary. It does away with subjects and objects. This post-humanist critique calls attention to how humanism has promoted a vision of power as something not only reserved for human subjects, but something more readily associated with a certain subset of humans. The traditional model of power as something possessed by human subjects and exercised over objects is clearly incompatible with post-humanist thinking. To develop a position that is capable of engaging completely with a post-anthropocentric and post-humanist position, we need to decouple power from human exceptionalism completely. To do this, I draw upon Deleuze's own thinking about the work of Foucault and the interpretation of both of these that one runs through the work of Rosie Bray Dotty. Deleuze discusses Foucault's position on power as follows. He says, power is not essentially repressive. It's practiced before it's possessed and it passes through the hands of the mastered no less than through the hands of the masters. Power is understood in this model as both potestas, that's the negative, repressive, and entrapping aspects of power, but also as potentia, the positive, affirmative, empowering aspects of power. It's not that power is either entrapping or empowering, it is always both at once. Power is not a single entity, it doesn't have a singular origin, it's not got a subject or an object, instead it's relational, multiple, multi-layered, and dynamic. It's a flow that twists and turns through relations, forming a messy rhizome. Post-humanist philosophers ask us to focus on how relations shape the emergence of people, plants, animals, insects, and many other things besides. These relations are shaped by power. Power, therefore, has a crucial role in determining the properties and particular affects, shout out to tomorrow's session on affect, um, that components can have. It shapes what is possible. Drawing on Foucault, Deleuze tells us that power has no form, but shows up as an affect, and is both the ability to affect and to be affected. We cannot locate power in the warrior with the sword standing over the dead body of his vanquished foe. Rather, it's flowing through a multiple, multitude of relations. And to study power, Bredotti tells us to make cartographies and map these flows. So a new image of power is emerging here. It's not possessed or exercised. It's not limited to humans. Neither is it limited to things or animals. It's a flow through messy relationships that appear as a rhizomatic tangle. It has both positive and affirmative aspects, as well as negative and repressing, repressive ones. This image of power isn't about creating a harmonious, free-flowing, romantic image of the world where plants, animals, and people all just get along. <laughs> this model of power helps us to better understand issues of social inequality and injustice as well. Power exists differently in various parts of assemblages and it becomes concentrated in some relations. Deleuze and Guattari use the term stratified to capture how some relations become so entangled and so dense that they come to endure. We can think about the patriarchy as a good example of a stratified assemblage and a good way to think through our post-humanist stance on power. It's not the case that the patriarchy exists in the mind of some master manipulator who's designed it for his own convenience, although often it does feel that way, nor is it concentrated in one single sovereign locus. Rather, it's dispersed through millions of relations. The patriarchy is a complex assemblage. It's in things, animals, and plants as much as it's in people. It's not just ideas about the rightful place of men and women and the nature of sexual and gender difference. It's also in buildings and work schedules. It flows through relations in order to stratify them in the material world, making them more concrete. Power also creates certain sorts of components and allows them to emerge. 
It shapes the relations that young people exist within. It produces the media they consume and the role models they have. These relations have the capacity to affect young people, to make them believe that any job is open to them or that leadership roles are only for men. In a new materialist, post-humanist approach, there is both no reason why men should inherently, naturally and timelessly emerge as leaders and every reason produced through thousands of relationships in, in a multitude of assemblages, why more often than not today that is the case. The image that of power that emerges here is one that allows us to explain the nature of power and how some components emerge as particularly powerful through their relationships. It's capable of explaining and describing the humanist image of the powerful man. Importantly, however, it's not a timeless static image of power that says that men will always emerge as powerful leaders. Other things are possible. To close, I want to return to the Bronze Age with my new theoretical tools. The warrior chief is basically the invention of a humanist ideal against which all other Bronze Age humans fail to compare. He's European, he owns property and capital, he's educated in the ways of the world, he's able-bodied enough to fight and he has some wives. He's rich <laughs> and therefore he's powerful and therefore he is a leader. It's clear that this model is patriarchal and humanist, but it's also built on a misunderstanding of the nature of power, i.e. the idea that the chief possesses power. If we continue to see power as something that has an origin and can be possessed, we uphold and promote a bad model of power and we act to make that model appear timeless from today to Trump and Boris Johnson. So critique alone isn't enough to deconstruct the warrior chief and his power. We need new narratives too. And therein lies the challenge at the heart of my dilemma from the opening of the paper. What new narrative do I replace my Bronze Age problem with? I think there are two key steps here. First, we have to continue to critique and deconstruct and then eventually replace the warrior chief model. Second, we have to stop talking about warrior chiefs and think instead about some other identities in the period and other forms of power. For post-humanist thinkers, identity isn't a category that we place people in, but a process, and humans are always deeply entangled in multiple relationships. We need to embed warriors in this process and in these relations to consider how they're not born a warrior, but become one. To, do to, to, do, to become a warrior takes a multitude of relations with other people and materials through which power flows. That power is both potentia and potestas. The sword empowers the warrior with greater capacities for violence, but it also entraps him in assemblages of relations with others, creating dependencies, debts, and perhaps traumas. I've begun to sketch the outline of a new understanding of the warrior as embedded and entangled, no longer the locus of power, but part of a rhizome that, that power flows through. Much more work is needed. The second step in this process is investing effort in what Deleuze and Guattari would term minoritarian or other identities of the period, in all those who've been painted as secondary to the chiefs and warriors. But that is a task for another day. Thank you very much. <laughs>